commercial services. Hello and welcome to the Go Anteater podcast. My name is Russell Jenkins. I am your host today and today I have a joining is Travis Gates. He is our trainer here at ABC and he knows a lot about bugs. So how are you doing today, man? I'm doing all right, Russ. We're, uh, you know, hanging in, just seeing how things go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot about bugs. That's, uh, that's my special my secret special skill Your superpower. Uh, my, my superpower yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm i'm just the guy that knows random things about bugs <laughs> insects in particular arthropods as a whole but we can say bugs because that's what people recognize uh, true that's true well typically we have the gross the interesting types of stories but today i was thinking let's do a little bit of a different spin so Maybe let's go over some of the beneficial insects that are out there because most of the ones that we've covered are pests. So let's give uh, some light onto the fact that there are some beneficial insects out there. I mean, we, we've got a couple things that are very beneficial. They can kind of be pests. So there is a little wiggle room there in certain situations. Um, honeybees, mm -hmm. kind of a major player in this game. So honeybees, most people recognize what a honeybee is. Um, you know, we, we all know they make honey, surprisingly <laughs> enough, based on the name, right? We, we named them after the product they made, of course. Um, but honeybees are responsible for fertilizing, well, fertilizing, it's kind of a fertilization process, but pollinating um, a huge variety of crops, right? right. So cereals, all the grains, uh, nuts, fruit, things like that um, depend on pollinators. Mm -hmm. And we do have our European honeybee here in the U.S., which is kind of our primary industrial honeybee that's kind of a raised, almost livestock option there. Um, right. They are treated as livestock for a lot of, like, agricultural exemptions and things like that on properties. Um, and it is a multi-billion dollar industry, honeybee pollination. Um, there are people who just do that, and they move truckloads of bees across the country to different crops to to sit and pollinate and do their thing. Um, you do get a certain amount of pollination that's done by kind of native species, native bees, flies, butterflies, moths, things like that, right. that also visit the flowers. But honeybees are just really efficient at it. Oh, yeah. um, they're, they're just really good at moving from place to place and spreading the little bits of pollen as necessary. And, you know, they're going to harvest a bit of that in the mix and take that home and use that as food. That's a good protein source for them. Um, and then the nectar, the, the sugary liquids from the flowers, um, is what we're turning into our honey. Um, and essentially they're slurping it all up, they take it home, they kind of mix it with some digestive enzymes and uh, puke it back up. And that's where you get honey. So bee puke is, is honey, which is delicious, delicious bee puke. Yes. So, yeah, um, you know, they're making a food for us. It's a fully animal-produced food there where mm -hmm. they're doing all the work, they produce it, and we can just harvest it then after it's completely manufactured. Um, and, I mean, honey is amazing on its own in that it basically never goes bad. Right. Um, you know, it can crystallize. Most people have seen their honey crystallize. You can just warm it up, and it will go back into its natural liquid state. Right. Um, and, I mean, it's actually let's see it's anesthetic so if you get a cut or something you can smear honey on it and it can actually prevent bacteria um it's good for you if you have allergies eating local honey you can actually mm -hmm. help inoculate yourself against some local allergens i mean it's it's a pretty cool thing that we oh, just yeah. have this insect that produces this kind of miracle product for us and also is responsible for then making plants produce most of the food that we eat. Exactly. So, I mean, we, th we think about the amount of work that they're doing for us in just our day-to-day -day lives, and it's, it's a pretty incredible impact that they have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we get the professional beekeepers, we get hobbyist beekeepers, we get unwilling beekeepers who just have honeybees move into a structure on them because they're always looking for space. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, that's where we transition into the kind of bees showing up as a pest sometimes. Um, yeah. I don't know. Have you had any positive or negative experiences with honeybees? Uh, most of them are positive. I mean, honestly, if you're not going to swat, you're not going to mess with them. They just mind their own business. Yeah. Pretty and chill, right? Oh, just yeah. Little ladies out there doing their job. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it is primarily the female. 
So all of our ants, bees, and wasps, it's really the females that you're seeing. Um, so any of the ones that can sting you are going to be females. The males show up just long enough to mate, do their thing, and then they die. So uh, not a lot of male presence in that world. Right. Um, but hardworking ladies. Right? Oh, yeah. The backbone of most places, hardworking ladies. Absolutely. So um, you know, it's, it's just a really incredible kind of model organism for a lot of different systems. A truly social insect they have a very organized colony structure with mm -hmm. the queen that's kind of dictating what's going on. Um, they communicate kind of complex concepts to each other as far as distances and kind of colors and positions of plants, flowers. Um, even when they're looking for a new hive space, uh, they'll send out little scouts that will go into a void space and walk around to measure it. And then they'll come back and communicate to their nest mates, hey, I found a space this far away that's this big. And then the nest gets to the side. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. They'll move in there. Right. So, I mean, they come back and they do their little dances and com communicate some pretty incredible things, honestly. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just a really interesting thing to kind of read deeper on. So if you, if you find books about honeybees, I mean, they'll, they'll keep you occupied for a while, just learning random little facts. Oh, yeah. And if we come across them in the field, we call a beekeeper because you mm -hmm. want to make sure that you keep them alive because they are a very big importance to our world. And so yeah. that's something it's it's not something that we're going to go into the mindset of we need to eradicate this pest. It's it's more 100%. we need to relocate that pest. Yeah, as much as possible. So there are going to be in extenuating circumstances sometimes where it's an immediate danger to people, to like children, children, things like that. And Especially children. you just have to do something quickly to alleviate that concern. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've had that pop up on occasion where the bees show up in a spot that is a threat to people. And you do have to unfortunately deal with them more directly there. But in most cases, we are going to have a beekeeper or someone come out to remove the bees and relocate, rehome mm -hmm. them somewhere. Uh, a lot of beekeepers are honestly happy to come and take your bees because they get a new colony out of the mix. Absolutely. And I mean, for people who do that as a business, every colony is producing a, a decent chunk of money for you as they get established. So it's just like a nice little chunk of change that falls into your lap for a few hours work. So yeah, we, we try not to kill them. We, we do use our, our arsenal of beekeepers that we've got contacts for to kind of reach out and try to help us out in that capacity. And I mean, removing bees can be a pretty in-depth process because mm -hmm. we can't just worry about sucking up the bees that are in the open um, you've got a whole system of honeycomb typically that's already built up in a void space um, so if it's a colony that's been present in that area for a while we do have to think about the fact that you've got comb with larvae and honey and things like that that is in that void um, when the bees are present they will regulate the temperature so they'll actually keep the wax from melting. They keep everything cool enough that it holds its shape. Right. If we just remove the bees but not the comb, now you end up with larvae that are dying. So you have decaying basically bee larvae, which are, look like little grubs. Um, you've got honey and wax that is now softening to the point mm -hmm. where it will start to drip and ooze, sometimes oozing out of people's power outlets, baseboards, things like that. looks like a horror movie a little bit. Um, and it's attracting all kinds of other pests, right? Ants and wasps, uh, beetles, all kinds of different things like to come in and eat now the decaying larva and the honey and stuff. It's all just free resource now. So you're attracting even rodents will come in and try to get into the space to eat all of that stuff. So you can actually give yourself a lot more problems by not doing the in-depth job up front. So sometimes the beekeepers will have to remove siding, soffits, things like that to get into the space mm -hmm. to physically access it and remove all that material. And I mean, fortunately, at ABC, we've got handyman, and they can come out and help patch things up if people want to go that direction. Or sometimes we will actually, you know, have them call whoever they want. Maybe they do it themselves. We've got a lot of self-sufficient DIYers now. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, we we want to be kind to the bees, and there's been a lot of news stories, right? So we've got a lot of information in the news about colonies declining, mm -hmm. uh, the bee population declining, and honestly, we're we're kind of at a a steady level with our bee colonies right now. Um, we're not seeing any in depth decline at the moment. Um, there has been a dip in population levels since beekeeping started to be kind of documented um we i think starting in the 30s or 40s 
they started really doing kind of bee census to track how many people were keeping bees. Um, and from that original number back then, we do have a little dip. Gotcha. But we also think we've got a lot more urbanization and things like that right. now. So less space, less people who have the capacity to keep bees. Um, but populations are okay. Um, you know, we hear about the impact of things like pesticides on bees. It is still an issue. Right. Um, but pesticide manufacturers know if their product could be a threat, and they label accordingly. The EPA puts those things. The wording is required on the labels. So products will tell you specifically, do not apply if bees are present or active or flowering plants are present, right? Because they want to avoid impacting the bees on right. accident. Um, and, you know, it's according to the law. If I see bees, I'm not going to put my product out because I can't. The label is the law. It tells us what to do. Absolutely. So um, it it's interesting that, you know, it's it's kind of an insect that is protected from insecticides. And there are mistakes made. There have been issues where people are just not being responsible applicators. Um, obviously, we can impact colonies there. Um, sometimes it's accidental. People didn't notice the flowers. Some plants have, you know, little green flowers that blend right into the leaves. Right, right. So someone who doesn't know what to look for may not see that kind of thing. So, you know, there's going to be some impact, but... Most of the major impact we think of from pesticides ends up coming more from the world of agriculture, where we're having large areas treated at once. Obviously, if I'm crop dusting a field, I can't see if there's bees in the field, right? right? right. Whereas, you know, when we're doing structural pest control, we've got a little more control. We can, we can kind of pull our finger off the trigger real quick if, we're, if we notice the bees show up. So it's, I mean, you're going to have some downside there, but... We also get a lot of benefits from doing that kind of treatment in crops and things to some capacity. So as much as I'd love to think we can do all of this stuff and grow industrial levels of you know, food without impacting them with pesticides and fertilizers, we're, we're the human race and we consume. So it is a downside there, but that's kind of off topic. Huh. I'm rambling a little no, bit. No, no, it's great. It's great. What are we talking about with bees then? <laughs> well, I know it's funny for whenever we, you know, first moved into our house, it was one of those things where before we didn't have a lot of plants around. We hadn't able to have a lot of that stuff. So we finally got some into our landscaping at the house. And Mary Margaret made fun of me because she was like, you are like a little kid in a candy store when you w walked outside one day and you're like, we have bees. I'm yeah. s I, I love bees. I've it's always exciting. Been, right? Yeah, it's, it's amazing to see them. They're just you're like. <laughs> nice it just makes you smile makes you happy i know when we we were planting our back garden beds that was one thing it's like ooh, this plant's good for bees this one's good for bees let's exactly. get that one that one's good for bees exactly it's like yeah i'm totally fine with bees showing up because they're not going to mess with me they're here because i've got pretty flowers and they exactly. like the colors yeah funnily enough our our abc logos on our trucks the color that we use for the stickers we put on the vehicles um is attractive to bees huh so every once in a while, you'll walk out to one of our vehicles, and you'll see bees will be sitting on one of the letters or something on the side of the truck. Um, and they're just seeing the colors. Because obviously, insects see the colors differently than we do right. anyways. So right. whereas we see it as, oh, it's maroon, they see it as, ooh, nice bright red flower or whatever it is. So we will find bees that kind of just buzz down just to check out the truck to see if any of those flowers have any nectar in them, but it's just a bunch of stickers <laughs> on a truck. Um, so they get a little confused, but they do that with any bright colors, right? Because that's how they're wired. Right. Find the bright spots because that's where we might find nectar and stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see them explore the world. For sure. And they don't tend to bother people around like sodas and things like that the same way. Um, though, interestingly enough, things like some of the big, uh, you know, soda factories, the distribution facilities, things like that that we have, um, where they have large amounts of sweeteners or maybe product that has ruptured that they keep outside before it goes to garbage, they get a lot of bee populations there because it is an easy source of sugar. Right. Um, we actually do service for a company that does bulk sweeteners. So that's their business is they ship them, come in on rails, transfer them to semis, things like that. So they have these huge silos that are filled with sweeteners with these little pits underneath where spillage and stuff collects. And it's constantly busy with bees. But the bees don't bother anyone. Right. They're just there because, hey, free sweetener. Exactly. And they're cleaning things up. So they're not a bad thing to have around because they're going to be really thorough picking up all the sweetener. Absolutely. But I know there's been circumstances uh, in the past where it was an M&M manufacturing plant 
and they had blue M&Ms or something, or the blue candy coating for the M&Ms yeah. that had been stored outside. And local beekeepers found that their bees had blue honey because they had been feeding on this free, like, blue sweetener <laughs> from the M&M plant. That's interesting. So, you know, it will impact the color of the honey, but it's still a sweetener. So in the end, it's still honey. Right. So, you know, we think about all the different honeys you can buy, the clover honey and wildflower honey, orange blossom. Like, it does affect the taste. And I, in college, we actually, I took a honeybee course and we did a honey tasting. That's cool. And you could taste the different notes of different things and different honeys. So I like that. it's, it's kind of interesting. I know in Hawaii, I tried macadamia honey and you can, you get a little nuttiness out huh. of the honey, which is kind of funny, but funny honey. Um, but <laughs> it was just an interesting kind of taste testing experience. Cause you think it's honey, right? It's sweet, but all those little environmental things that are out in their world will actually impact the, the end result that they produce. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, bees as a whole, like, I would, I would encourage anyone to kind of, like, just read about bees. Agreed. And there's some amazing books and things that people have written about bees and their time with bees, research on bees, all kinds of stuff. So you don't have to go super sciencey. Some of them are going to be much more approachable from, you know, hey, I'm a beekeeper and this is just my observations of my bees. But it's just a cool thing to look up. For I mean, sure. It's, it's basically like their own little cities, mm -hmm. and we get to kind of just watch what they do. And one, so. of the, one of the misconceptions is that, you know, people are so nervous about getting stung by them. But that is, Absolutely. That is a last resort for, for bees, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we've got our whole group of hymenopterans, which are going to be bees, ants, and wasps, right? Um, and... Most of them do have kind of straight stingers or sting, string, uh, stingers with kind of minor barbs on them. So it can catch, but it generally doesn't. So we think about like yellow jackets, paper mm -hmm. wasps, things like that. Um, they can sting multiple times. The stinger will basically just pierce and slide back out and they'll do it again. Um, honeybees generally do have barbs on the stinger. Um, so in most circumstances, because of our knee-jerk reaction to a sting, your swatting the bee off of you kind of is what causes the harm, tears that stinger out. Right. And you'll see the stinger is attached to the little venom, venom gland, and you'll see this little kind of squishy, almost like yellowy, orangey organ attached to the stinger that's stuck in your skin. So you do have to be careful removing the stinger so you don't squeeze the little sack of venom and just pump yourself full of more venom. But, you know, what they found is if you actually give them a second, they will work the stinger out and pull the stinger out. They don't want to rip the stinger off. Exactly. It's not trying to be a kamikaze attack. It just usually ends up that way because how do you react to a sting? You know, you swat at it, right? So, yeah, if we're a little more patient with things that hurt us, we can... We can let them survive too. Or, but. or just don't swat in general. I mean, if in you general, just don't mind your own business, right? they'll mind their own business nine times out of ten. And what I would encourage people to do is, bees are remarkably docile. Mm -hmm. Normally, you can walk right up to most bee colonies, and as long as you're not an immediate threat, they won't bother you. Exactly. They just want to do their job. They are busy. They don't have time for you, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's you accidentally step on one that's on the ground or you accidentally squish one when you lean against the tree to look at the colony or whatever it is. Um, it's triggering a response from the colony because they sense the distress of a nest mate and they are responding to that stimulus. Right. Right. It's not that they're hyper aggressive. They're just going, hey, don't mess with our family. Exactly. So which anyone would do. Yeah. And I mean, the stings can be a threat. Right. Not everyone is going to have any real issue with the sting most of the time. You'll get a sting, a couple stings. Right. But any social insect, the thing I would really encourage people to think of is anything that lives in a colony, in a nest, you should approach with some respect just because they are designed to protect the colony. Exactly. So you're not going to get away with one, typically. You're going to get away with a handful of stings because when that one stings you, it triggers the response from any of the surrounding bees to say, hey, that spot, that guy, get him. Right? They aren't going to necessarily chase you for miles. You know, we hear stories about people having to dive into the swimming pool to avoid the bees, which I would encourage you to avoid doing because the bees will just wait above the water because they still smell the pheromone. Um, but it, it's not a common occurrence, right? right? It's, right. it's going to be accidental or someone was being a jerk and they tried to go up and mess with the bees and smack them. There's some video I saw online of a guy who walks right up to a bee colony and like, bangs on it yep. with a two liter bottle or yep. something it's like what did you expect yeah. would happen 
So yeah, don't come to my house and do it. I'll do the same thing. You're gonna put yeah, your yeah. hand in fire. You might get burned. Yeah, and I mean the people we're gonna be much more concerned with with stings are going to be people who are sensitive to the venom. Um, so it is a decently common allergy to have mm -hmm. sensitivity to hymenopter and venom. So again, ants, bees, and wasps all kind of fit together in that group. Um, and because then you have the added negative of the social aspect there, you're not just getting one dose, right? You can get multiple doses. So those are people who are going to experience much more severe reactions. Mm -hmm. um, we will see anaphylaxis, things like that, where you know airways close. Um, you'll see lots of swelling, hives. I've seen people get some really horrifying like blisters that pop up from stings. And it's just your body kind of reacting a lot more strongly to that venom. Right. And, you know, even in pest control, we have technicians who are allergic. They know they're allergic. They carry EpiPens and things with them just in case. Absolutely. But, I mean, you think about our job in this industry. We go out and we knock down wasp nests. We deal with bees and things like that. And you really don't get stung much, right? Because you approach with caution. You have some respect for what you're dealing with. Exactly. And about the only ones that are going to come out to you and get you specifically are going to be like yellow jackets, mm -hmm. which are not bees. So if we're talking about nice, friendly honeybees, yeah, it's a whole different ball game. Absolutely. Uh, we used to have a colony in a tree right outside the office mm -hmm. in Louisville. I remember that. And they were there for years, just inside a hole in the tree. And you could walk right up and stick your face next to it and watch what they were doing. And they'd just fly right past your head. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes they'd bump into your head trying to get back into the opening, <laughs> but they just fly around it once they bumped into you. They don't want to mess with you. Exactly. And I'm not a threat. I'm just observing. So, I mean, it's... You know, respect. It's all about respect. Agreed. Get a little Mr. T in here, right? <laughs> so, um, I don't know. It's they're just a really cool thing with some threat tied to them. Yeah, but, but yeah, minimal. It, it's minimal if we show them a little respect. Yeah, exactly. Right? I agree. I guess it's Aretha. Mr. T was I pity the fool. Yeah. It's been a while since I've dealt with Mr. T, I guess. <laughs> we'll talk Aretha instead. Um Andrea's going to sing us respect, right? That's how you're going to close this out. <laughs> it's just a, a full rendition of respect. There you go. There you go. But, they, I mean, as you guys can hear, there is definitely beneficial insects out there. It's not only ones that are going to come that try to mess with you or their pests always. There, there is benefits to a lot of the insects that we have in this world. And we do need to respect them because it is something that if we're not careful with, then we could see declining um, populations but now that we, we have a lot of people more cognizant hopefully that's not really going to be an issue moving forward for things and i will float that we do see decline in insect populations already human impact on the world has been pretty drastic mm -hmm. so there is a kind of steady decline we're in an extinction event right now which is basically human caused extinction that's happening so we are seeing insect populations decline just because of environmental impact and things like that. So anything we can do to minimize impacting non-target pests. Um, so we think about all of the pest species, or sorry, I'm even incorrect there, all of the insect species that are out there, hundreds of thousands of identified species, more, right? Um, less than 1% of those are going to be what we would consider a pest. Right. So it's a very small fraction of the total that are something we actually need to be concerned with. Agreed. And even when we have something that could potentially be dangerous, but normally isn't. It's like, do we consider it a pest? Not normally, unless there's some sort of really weird event happening. Right. So yeah, if the bees moved in and we're sitting in my front door, that would be an issue, right? We gotta do something about that. For sure. But if they're going into the eaves on the second floor of my house, they're not really a threat to anyone right now. We'll get someone out to remove that. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we, we try to approach our, our insects with, you know, some level of understanding. Mm -hmm. And it's an idea that not everything is a problem. Not absolutely. everything is bad. Do we want things indoors? No. Those are pests, right? They're pests when they're in a space we don't want them to be. But they're not always a threat. Agreed. They're not always a worry. Agreed. So we're trying not to kill everything. That's yeah. why we're pest management now, right? We're not exterminators. Nobody wants to be the people that killed the last of something. Oh, absolutely So, not. yeah, we would like to do our best to kind of harbor, you know, information and share information about these organisms rather than just go out there and just spray and pray and hose things down, right? It's less about killing things and more about people learning some things. Mm -hmm. We want our customers to understand, you know, 
there are some different things. There are things to be worried about. There's a lot of them not to be worried about. Agreed. Agreed. So that's well, my opinion. Oh, I would, I would agree with that. My two cents. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to thank you for giving that perspective into the podcast because a lot of it we haven't had where we've talked about beneficial insects. So it's nice to have that type of talk, give a little bit of a pause. Um, and I hope that everyone listening today got something from this. We're able to kind of get some cues, tips, and understanding. Maybe they understand and have a little bit more respect towards honeybees after this talk. I really hope so um, because they are an important insect to us. And I hope that everyone um, please like, you know, subscribe, give a thumbs up, share, whatever you can to get this podcast more out there, especially something like this, because this is going to give more information out to the public. Um, and I want to thank you, Travis, for being on today's episode. I really enjoyed it and looking forward to having more with you. Well, thank you, sir, for having me. <laughs> I Save will. the bees. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Cheers and have a wonderful rest of the day. ABC Home and Commercial Services.